Good evening. I'm glad you're here for our Hope and Anchor uh, Good Friday gathering. Uh, tonight is going to be a little bit special in the sense that uh, we get to uh, listen to the Word. We get to listen to Scripture. And uh, what we're doing tonight is a little bit of a throwback to uh, two Good Fridays ago, which was right in the grip of the pandemic shutdown. And uh, back in those days, we were, uh, I was kind of anti-video, so I was just recording Sunday messages on the podcast, <laughs> I, I think maybe me and two other people in the whole world uh, were listening, but that's okay. Anyway, on Good Friday, we uh, gathered around the whole family and uh, recorded the passion story, and we listened to songs and stuff and just put it out there because it's like wherever we all were, we wanted to maybe connect and uh, because good good friday is a is a is an important day it's a strange and difficult day as well um, as a follower of jesus we enter willingly into this recollection this remembering and we find that here is discomfort there's something about good friday that makes the names kind of weird you know we were talking earlier about why is it called good friday but well, it is so good when you think about what god is accomplishing in christ through the terrible events that took place on the first Good Friday. So us, as we as Christ followers, we must not be timid. We must not be um, uh, timid about entering into that discomfort because here in that discomfort is where we find the cross. Everything about the cross was uncomfortable. In that discomfort, um, God delivered unto us through Jesus' life, his death, and then in three days, his resurrection. He delivered to us our salvation. And so even though we feel discomfort, rumbling underneath the ground, there is the hopefulness. Even now, even tonight, as we read the story, we know how the story ends, and there's a hopefulness rumbling. And so I hope and I pray that you feel that tonight as we gather. So there'll be song, there'll be scripture, and there'll be readings tonight. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we willingly come to you. Acknowledging the great sacrifice, the atoning work of Christ, who condescended to come and put on flesh and live among us, to show us the way to live, the way to live that leads to true life. Jesus came and he died for us, outstretched arms to embrace the world through his suffering and his death. Lord, I want my faith to be robust enough to tolerate a bit of discomfort. Because unless I'm willing, unless we are willing to tolerate discomfort, we will not be able to, to remain at the foot of the cross because everything about that place reminds us of our depravity, of our fallenness, of our sin, of our need to be forgiven, to be saved. So God, speak a fresh word to our hearts tonight as we sit in that discomfort. God, through it all, underneath it all, God, I pray that just tones of hopefulness would even now be breaking through like, like rays of sunlight through the storm. God, it was for the joy set before him that Christ died for us. The joy set before him. So God, may the joy set before us in the power of the resurrection animate us, motivate us tonight, we ask. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
satisfied my sins which passed the Jews in piety. They killed once an inglorious man, but I crucify him daily, being now glorified. Oh, let me then his strange love still admire, king's pardon, but he bore our punishment. And Jacob came clothed in vile, harsh attire, but to supplant and with gainful intent. God clothed himself in vile man's flesh, so that he might be weak enough to suffer woe. Well.
were saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Ravine with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas the betrayer knew this place, for Jesus had gone there many times with his disciples. The chief priests and Pharisees had given Judas a squad of soldiers and police to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. Stepping forward to meet them, he asked, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and as he said it, they all fell backwards to the ground. Once more, he asked them, Whom are you searching for? And again they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you, I am he, Jesus said, and since I am the one you are hereafter, let these others go. He did this to carry out the prophecy he had just made. I have not lost a single one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. But Jesus said to Peter, Put away your sword. Shall I not drink from the cup the Father has given me? So the Jewish police, with the soldiers and their lieutenant, arrested Jesus and tied him. First they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who told the other Jewish leaders, Better that one should die for all. Simon Peter followed along behind, as did the other disciple who was acquainted with the high priest. So that other disciple was permitted into the courtyard along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside the gate. Then the other disciple spoke to the girl watching the gate, and she let Peter in. The girl asked Peter, Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, he said, I am not. The police and the household servants were standing around the fire they had made, for it was cold. And Peter stood there with them, warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, What I teach is widely known, for I have preached regularly in the synagogue and temple. I have been heard by all the Jewish leaders and teach nothing in private that I have not said in public. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. You have some of them here. They know what I said. One of the soldiers standing there struck Jesus with his fist. Is that the way to answer the high priest? He demanded. If I lie, prove it, Jesus replied. Should you hit a man for telling the truth? Then, then Anna said, Jesus, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire, he was asked again, Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? Of course not, he replied. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear uh, Peter had cut off, asked, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Next, he was taken to the palace of the Roman governor. His accusers wouldn't go in themselves, for that would defile them, they said, and they wouldn't be allowed to eat the Passover lamb. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? What are you accusing him of doing? He wouldn't have, we wouldn't have arrested him if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him yourselves by your own laws, Pilate told him. But we want him crucified, they demanded, and your approval is required. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction concerning the method of his execution. Then Pilate went back into the palace and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. King, as you use that word, or as the Jews used it, Jesus asked. Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people and their chief priests brought you here. Why? What have you done? Then Jesus answered, I am not an earthly king. If I were, my followers would have fought when I was arrested by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate replied, But you are a king then? Yes, Jesus said. I was born for that purpose, and I came to bring truth to the world. All who love the truth are my followers. What is truth? Pilate exclaimed. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release someone from prison each year at Passover. So if you want me to, I'll release the king of the Jews. But they screamed back, No, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate laid open Jesus' back with a leaded whip, and the soldiers made a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and robed him in a royal purple. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked and struck him with their fists. 
Pilate went outside again and said to the Jews, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, robe, and Pilate said, Behold the man. At sight of him, the chief priests, the Jewish and Jewish officials began yelling, Crucify, crucify. You crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. They replied, By our laws, he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the palace again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. You won't talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power at all over me unless it were given to you from above. So those who brought me to you have the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders told him, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. At these words, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again and sat down at the judgment bench on the stone-paved platform. It was now about noon of the day before Passover, and Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest shouted back. Then Pilate gave Jesus to them to be crucified. So they had him at last, and he was taken out of the city, carrying his cross to the place known as the Skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign over him, reading, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the signboard was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people read it. Then the chief priest said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to, He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. It stays exactly as it is. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they put his garments into four piles, one for each of them. But they said, Let's not tear up his robe, for it was seamless. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my robe. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, Mary, his aunt, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside me, his close friend, he said to her, He is your son. And to me, he said, She is your mother. And from then on, I took her into my home. Jesus knew that everything was now finished, and to fulfill the scriptures said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so a sponge was soaked in it and put on a hyssop branch and held it to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. The Jewish leaders didn't want the victims hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath at that, for it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to order the legs of the men broken to hasten death, then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to him, they saw that he was dead already, so they didn't break his. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and blood and water flowed out. I saw all of this myself, and, given, and have given an accurate report so that you can also believe. The soldiers did this in fulfillment of the scripture that says, Not one of his bones shall be broken, and they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jewish leaders, boldly asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body down, and Pilate told him to go ahead. So he came and took it away. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, came too, bringing a hundred pounds of embalming ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Together they wrapped Jesus' body in a long linen cloth saturated with the spices, as is the Jewish custom of burial. The place of crucifixion was near a grove of trees, where there, now, where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because of the need for haste before the Sabbath, and because the tomb was close at hand, they laid him there. You have redeemed my soul 
from the pit of emptiness. You have redeemed my soul from death. You have redeemed my soul from the pit of emptiness. You have redeemed my soul from death. I was a hungry child, a child. But you put food in my body, water in my dry bed, to my blackened branches. You brought the springtime green of a new life. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. 
The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh. And he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. He has gone to free from sorrow the captives, Adam and Eve, he who is both God and the son of Eve. The Lord approached them bearing the cross, the weapon that had won him the victory. At the sight of him, Adam, the first man he had created, struck his breast in terror and cried out to everyone, My Lord, be with you all. Christ answered him, and with your spirit. He took him by the hand and raised him up, saying, Awake, O sleeper. And rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and for your descendants, I know, I know by my own authority command all who are held in bondage to come forth, all who are in darkness to be enlightened, all who are sleeping to arise. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands, you who were created in my image. Rise, let us leave this place, for you are in me and I am in you. Together we form only one person and we cannot be separated. For your sake, I, your God, became your son. I, the Lord, took the form of a slave. I, whose home is above the heavens, descended to the earth and beneath the earth. For your sake, for the sake of man, I became like a man without help, free among the dead. For the sake of you who left a garden, I was betrayed to the Jews in a garden, and I was crucified in a garden. See on my face the spittle I received in order to restore you the life I once breathed into you. See there the marks of the blows I received in order to refashion your warped nature in my image. On my back, see the marks of the scourging. I endure to remove the burden of sin that weighs upon your back. See my hands nailed firmly to a tree for you who once wickedly stretched out your hands to a tree. I slept on the cross and a sword pierced my side for you who slept in paradise and brought forth Eve from your side. My side has healed the pain in yours. My sleep will rouse you from your sleep in hell. The sword that pierced me has sheathed the sword that was turned against you. Rise, let us leave this place. The enemy led you out of this, out of the earthly paradise. I will not restore you to that paradise, but I will enthrone you in heaven. I forbade you the tree that was only a symbol of life. But see, I, who am life itself, am now one with you. The bridal chamber is adorned. The banquet is ready. The eternal dwelling places are prepared. The treasure houses of all good things lie open. The kingdom of heaven has been prepared for you from all eternity.
depart, remembering the despair of a world disappointed in its grandest hopes, entering into the emptiness of death by deliberately emptying the self of illusion and indulgence and self-importance, keeping vigil for Easter and waiting for the dawn. You're dismissed.